Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Now is the time to trim your lamps and get ready for the coming of the Lord. Stay tuned for the Midnight Cry broadcast. Praise God for the salvation that was, I believe, sung about with the Lord's presence. You know, isn't it a wonderful scripture where, where it says, uh, I'll praise you in the midst of my, in the midst of my brothers, I'll declare, in, the, in fact, I've got it open right here, it's in Hebrews chapter 2, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation, I will sing your praises. You know, you may just look around and see human flesh and blood, but there's more than that here this morning. I believe the Lord was present in a people, and it was by His strength that we were able to praise God. And I just I appreciate the, the wonderful salvation that was so clearly testified to this morning. And, uh, you know, I've had, a, I've had a burden that I haven't been able to shake, and I'll just express it. Because I believe it's, the burden, it's a burden of God's heart. We are in a late hour. But yet the principles involved in what, I'm th what I've been thinking about have applied in every age. And that's the burden that the writer to the Hebrews had when he uh, began chapter 2. He said, we must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? And that's the, that's the issue that the writer was continually dealing with was people who would become aware of what Jesus did but stop short of really entering into it. And uh, I, I see that. I, I see it in our midst. I believe we've got people here probably in every category. We've got people who know the Lord, and you know you know the Lord. And there's, there's just a witness in your heart that you're, that you're His. You've passed from death to life, and, and you can readily connect with something that exalts the Lord and lifts up His salvation, where you can sing about the, the, uh, the glory of the cross. That doesn't make a bit of sense to the world. But yet to somebody who has really entered in by revelation, by a work of God's Spirit, that means everything to you. That's life and death. That's the whole ball of wax. That's everything. And we can just rejoice and, and, and appreciate it and enter into it. And you've got others that have kind of embraced all of this because maybe you grew up in it. Maybe you came in. Maybe you know, you're, there's an interest there and you sort of embraced it up to a point. And we probably got some here who don't have a clue. And you're just sitting here wondering, what in the world is this all about? This is crazy, crazy stuff. Just a bunch of meaningless religion. I'll tell you, this is not meaningless religion. This is the Word of God. This, this is the truth. Jesus Christ is who He said He was. He is who the writers of Scripture said He was. And His resurrection proved it. There wasn't any doubt left in the mind of his followers that it was real. He, they touched him. They saw him. They saw that bruised, broken man come forth from the tomb with just the, only the marks left, just to, just to prove who he was. This wasn't somebody else that, the Lord had, that God had slipped in on him. This wasn't some sort of fakery. This was the real deal. This was the Son of God, and he came forth. The life he had, it wasn't the same life he went in there with. And that's the essence of what the gospel is about. If the gospel stops short of us entering into and possessing the life that Jesus had when he came out of the tomb, then it has stopped short of everything and nothing matters. You could spend your life in church singing hymns and go to hell. That's the reality of it. And I, and I, see, a, I see the mercy and the love of God is wanting to reach out and cause people to ask the question that Paul posed or the instruction that he gave, I guess I should say, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. What did he say there? Examine yourselves. Yes. You know, are you in the faith? Yes. Is this just something you have sort of embraced and professed up to a point but never really passed from death to life? You know, I, I had a scripture that, that keeps coming to me, and it's in John chapter 3, a very familiar passage. 
And it, it just kind of, a, you know, sometimes the Lord will bring a passage to your mind, but it's like a light gets turned on and there's a focus on a few words that just kind of jump off the page. And it's like, hey, did you ever notice this before? Let me, let me draw your attention. to this, this matters. This is not just a nice little piece of doctrine. Here's a, here's a truth that I want to convey to you, and this matters. All right, this is the uh, account of Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He was a teacher, member of the ruling council, it says. And, uh, some, but but he, something about Jesus intrigued him. There was in him a, a different kind of a spirit, I would say, I guess, a different appreciation for what Jesus was doing than many of his fellow Jewish leaders had. Obviously, you know, you get down to the end of the story, they were screaming for his, his crucifixion. He was the one who, who helped to bury Jesus. So obviously, you know, what Jesus, the, the work of God actually accomplished something in this man's life. But at this point, he didn't know. And so he came to Jesus, it says, by night, at night. And you can surmise from that that perhaps he didn't want to be seen or maybe he wanted to catch Jesus in a private moment. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us, but that's when he came. And he says, Rabbi, which means teacher, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you were doing if God were not with him. Now, I would pause and say that's not, that was his opinion. That's not entirely true because we know that the Bible clearly warns about lying signs and wonders. There is such a thing as miraculous power that does not come from God, but comes from the other realm. And so, uh, you know, there needs to be something besides that. There's a lot of people who run after that, and the devil takes full advantage. He uses power that he has to deceive people who don't really want God. They want something. They want to see something, feel something, experience something. You know, and that's, their, their heart is really after something different than God is after. But in any case, it got his attention, and so he came, and in reply, Jesus declared, didn't even comment on what he'd said. He said, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now, you know, there were scriptures read this morning about the kingdom. God has given his son a kingdom, and that kingdom will last forever. Now, we know that there is a kingdom that's operating in this world, and it has a king. He's called the God of this world in one place, and that's Lucifer. And the human race is born under his dominion. We have no power to escape sin, and sin's consequence is death. That's the, that's the realm that you and I are born into when we're born into Adam's family. But there is another kingdom, and that's the kingdom that will last forever. And Jesus said, you won't enter this without being born again. Well, of course, that, you know, you can see where Nicodemus was at. He didn't really have a clue. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. He's looking at this purely naturally, isn't he? But Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And here's the key to what he's trying to convey. It's flesh gives birth to flesh. You and I possess flesh because we were born of flesh. We all, we all had a mom. We all had a dad. Biologically speaking, we were, we were simply a product of, of Adam's family. The life that was in Adam has been reproduced, and here we are. That's the life we were born of, and that's all, you know, apart from something else happening, that's all we've got. Now, you can... You can bring forth a veneer of religion if you want to, and you can, cause, you can do all sorts of stuff, but if, if the only birth you have had is that which is flesh, then that's all you are. And did not Paul say in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it is, flesh and blood, what? Cannot inherit the kingdom of God. That's exactly the same thing Jesus said. There's, there's another kingdom, and you don't get in there simply by being born into the world. And, being, and even, be, even adding religion to what you are. It's, it's something else because this man to whom he was talking, he was religious as all get out. I mean, he was not just the average Joe. He was a ruler among the Jews. He was looked to as a leader. You want to know something about, about God, you go to this man. He knows, except he didn't. 
And Jesus was letting him know that there's something beyond what you understand. So flesh gives birth to flesh, but what? Spirit gives birth to spirit. There is a real spiritual birth that has to take place if we are ever to possess the life of God. And I'll tell you, this, this is an area where I see how the devil has so compromised Christianity in our modern world to cause people to, see, to believe that they have been saved when they have not. And so Paul rightly says, examine yourselves. And the purpose is not to cause fear and doubt. The purpose is to bring people to a certainty. God wants you to know. I don't mean he's going to come down and have an angel talk to you and, and show you your name in, written in gold or, or something like that. But I mean there is a conviction that can that could enter into the human heart when this is really done that's real and it's, it's there come hell or high water. You don't get rid of this. It's real. It's something that is permanent. But only spirit can give birth to this. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, here's the, here's the phrase or the uh, saying that was part of this that kind of jumped off the page at me. I'd never really particularly thought about it before that I can recall. It says, the wind blows where it pleases. That you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Now think about the wind. Anybody here got control of the wind? Anybody's got a formula for making the wind do what you want it to do? No. There is, see what has happened in so many places is that salvation has come to be presented as a formula. A, B, C, D. You take somebody down the Romans road. Everybody has sinned, come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. If, you know, if we confess, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, the Lord Jesus, we're saved. Okay, and, and then you take him to John. Everybody received him, becomes a son of God. Then gave you power to become a sons of God. Okay, now let's pray a prayer. And you pray the prayer, okay, what does it say? Okay, you're saved, you've been born again. Now, I don't want to say that God hasn't worked in spite of a lot of that, that God hasn't saved people. Praise God he has. But I'll tell you, there are churches across America today who have been filled with people who have done exactly what I have just said, and they're lost and don't know it. I know many of you will remember the, the testimony we listened to just two weeks ago. And you heard the testimony of a young woman who did exactly what I just described. And she wasn't insincere about it. She was sincere. But the, you know, what was the thing that she testified to after the fact? She didn't notice any real change. Nothing really changed. You know, it just comes back to my mind, the, uh, the rather humorous, to the point of being ridiculous, illustration that Paul Washer used in that one message where he said, suppose I came to you this morning and I rushed in late or whenever it was and uh, I said, I'm sorry I'm late. I was, uh, you know, standing by the road trying to hitchhike to get here and a 80,000 pound log truck ran over me and, uh, you know, that slowed me down but here I am. Yeah, I'll tell you, if an 80,000 pound log truck runs over you, there will be some evidence. <laughs> if you, I'll tell you, if the Spirit of God gives birth to the life of God in you, there will be evidence of that in your life. You will be a changed person. I'm not talking about some particular experience. Everybody's different. Guarantee we're all different in this respect. But there is a reality that God longs to bring. And there's so many people that come up to it. They, they, they talk about it. They believe, they believe in it. But somehow they never enter in. What's the deal here? 
See, I tell you, we could invite people down here t today and, and you know, preach some emotionally charged message and get people all excited and come down here and, and get them to sign on the dotted line, as it were. Would that save them? No. Why? The wind blows where it wants to. I tell you, God's not stupid. God knows. There is a supernatural work of God that has to take place in a heart. And if that doesn't take place... Nothing happens. You can try to manipulate it and get it to happen. I tell you, we're going to have to do what Jesus did. You know, the one thing that's really interesting, not only, you know, what he says about the wind blowing where it wants to or it pleases, Jesus doesn't give us a formula. Here's how you make it happen. You just do this and you pray this prayer and it's just somehow magically happened. Oh, no. God has got to work with a heart. And until that work is accomplished and he actually comes in, you're not there yet. And I'll tell you, I believe it, it concerns me, but I believe it concerns the heart of God who reaches out in love that there be nobody here who somehow hears all of this, somehow claims it, somehow believes and is able to maneuver it around where I'm a Christian, I'm, I've been born again. But there hasn't really been a change in here. You know, Andrea talked about how, you know, she was a deceitful person just in her nature. She was so interested in pleasing people that she learned to be a good liar, among other, other issues. Somehow that didn't change. She could do that and, and not really have a conscience about it. But oh, after she met God, man, was there a sensitivity? Do you know what that's about? You know what it is to, to have God convict you of something that nobody else is even aware of? This is not, hey, I'm, somebody's looking, I better behave myself. This is not coming from outside. This is not, you know, oh, here's the, here's the religion I've adhered to. I better, better toe the line. Somebody might be looking. This isn't some external conformity. This is something in your heart. Nobody knows about this but you and God. But you're convicted about it, and it might just be as simple as an attitude. If you can just have a human attitude, and you know what I mean, not the kind you ought to have, and it not bother you at all, something's missing. Something's missing. I tell you, everybody that's in Christ is a new creation. And I love Andrea's illustration of what repentance is. That baseball, it radically changes direction when the bat encounters it. And there is a change that is on the inside that suddenly you can see the kingdom of God. It becomes real. That doesn't mean you're some way, way up here. It doesn't mean there aren't battles. It doesn't mean there are a lot, of, a lot of things. But I tell you, there's a work of God that we cannot short circuit. If God ever convicts you, if he ever brings you into his kingdom, he's going to deal with your heart. He's going to deal with your will. He's going to bring a sin consciousness to you where you suddenly see yourself not just in relation to everybody else in the culture around you. All of a sudden it's, oh my God, I've got to stand there and answer to him. And you become conscious of how unclean and unworthy and unfit you are. And it's real. And it isn't just something where you're going like this all the time. There has to come a point where you just, oh God, I, I don't want to be this way. I want to change. Lord, I can't change. I need you to change me. Lord, I don't want to go this direction. I want to go with you, but I need you, Lord. I tell you, God's going to deal with your will about stuff. I tell you, if Jesus ever comes in, he's going he's to come in as Lord. I tell you, if you ever come to Christ, you don't belong to yourself. You don't have the right to run and do your own thing. You belong to another. You're his. Oh, I tell you, to, be, to belong to somebody who is love itself, you've got something better than that going in your life. You are... Well, you're in delusion. 
God needs to open your eyes to see the reality of what it means to serve and to love this kind of a being, a God who, who loves you in spite of what you are and what I am, a God who can forgive sins, a God who can be merciful, a God who is patient and kind and, and draws us with his love, but he's dead serious too. This is not where you can mess around and say, well, God, I'll give you 95%, but here's an area I can't let go. You think you can pray a prayer and get around that? No. I'll tell you, the wind blows where it wants to. And the wind is not going to blow for you until God brings you to that place where he's Lord. And there's a surrender. And there's a faith that looks to him and believes the promise. God has got to work those things in a heart. Only he can do it. But I'll tell you, there's a time and there's a place where God brings a heart to that moment of birth. And then he comes in. And everything is changed from that moment on. This has been the Midnight Cry broadcast. If you would like a DVD or a CD of today's message in its entirety, please request it by program number. DVDs are $10 and CDs are $5. And for those who request it, we will send you our quarterly publication, The Midnight Cry Messenger, free and postage paid. Send your request to Midnight Cry Ministries, Post Office Box 685, Southern Pines, North Carolina, 28388. We invite you to join us again next week at this same time, and may God richly bless you until then.